Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all are enjoying yourself here. Uh, just to give you a context, uh, I completed my PhD at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and was mentored by Dr. McBride, Dr. Donovan, and Dr. Fees. So I'm really thankful to Dr. Fees for inviting me here and sharing uh, how I have taken my work that I did in my PhD and applying it in my new position. And it's also an honor to talk with speakers who have greatly inspired my work. Oh, and I realize that my slides are not up yet. So today I'm going to talk to you about family meals, but within the childcare context. So childcare providers can be a major force in shaping children's eating behaviors and preventing childhood obesity. This is because a majority of the children in the United States attend childcare, and childcare providers' feeding practices or how they feed children have shown to impact children's eating behaviors and dietary intake. Also, while in full-time childcare, children consume up to five meals and snacks every day. This presents a great opportunity to help children develop healthy eating behaviors. So we looked at this uh, educational tool uh, today and childcare programs who participate in federal food assistance programs like the Child and Adult Care Youth Program have to adhere to certain meal pattern requirements that uh, are reflective of serving meals from these different food groups. But the question is that how do we feed children when they might be, you know, picky eater, or pe perceived as a picky eater? Or uh, it, uh, research has also shown that at the preschool age, children might experience something called as food neophobia or the reluctance to try new foods that greatly uh, reduces their preferences for all of these food groups and specifically for vegetables and food preferences impact food choices in children. So how do we feed children? First thing in childcare, a straightforward approach to be used by childcare providers, pressure children to eat. Uh, let's see if you make a clean plate or a happy plate, you should have a no thank you bite or you, sh you need to take a bite even if you don't like the food. Using restriction, Restricting access to unhealthy foods. If you have that salad, guess what's for dessert? Very commonly used even in childcare programs. And the other strategy is, well, you don't know how much you have to eat. You have to eat enough. Your parent tells me that I have to make you eat enough. So I'm just going to serve you self-selected or adult served portions and you need to eat this. As we saw uh, in the presentations today, the strategies I just discussed with you are that seem to be straightforward approaches to getting children to eat healthier foods are related to unhealthy eating behaviors and are a risk factor for childhood obesity. Uh, so what about controlling feeding practices in childcare? We, uh, childcare providers uh, completed a questionnaire about their feeding practices, and they reported that they rarely use uh, controlling feeding practices during meal times. And this was irrespective of the childcare context. It did not matter whether the provider is from Head Start or not from Head Start. However, in that same survey, these providers re reported that they significantly use non-internal comments, like uh, eat some more, you need to finish this sandwich, versus internal comments. So there is some discrepancy here in terms of understanding, saying that, oh, I don't use food as reward, versus using verbal com uh, comments that reflect controlling feeding practices. Then we also interviewed these childcare providers. Uh, uh, this was a qualitative study. And as you can see from this first quote, 
uh, when these providers were asked that why is it hard for them to avoid controlling feeding practices, this provider said, sometimes you'll have that stubborn kid that just won't eat. So sometimes it's hard to find a way to get them to eat. That's fine without really pressuring them or yelling at them. The other provider said, I don't think there's anything wrong with praising children for finishing their food, especially if there is a child who is a picky eater. Now, this provider was very interesting. Um, when I was interviewing her, uh, she told me, well, I never use food as reward. But eventually, as we went into the interview, she said, well, wait, I have to tell you. I give children a skittle when, uh, for them to go to party. And, uh, and then she said, you know, uh, well, oh, yes, but that is food as reward. But uh, it is very important for party training. She said that not giving a food treat as reward would be hard not to do. It would make party training so much worse. And then this discrepancy in understanding what is the difference between pressure and encourage, yes. We always tell adult caregivers, you, we need to encourage children to eat more fruits and vegetables, eat a variety of foods. So this provider says, I try not to pressure the children to eat. I encourage them, maybe once, maybe twice. I'll say, come on, why don't you be brave and give it a try? And you might like it. Try at least a tiny bite. So again, this is using non-internal cues, you know, trying to make children to eat. So in summary, I have discussed that controlling feeding practices lead to negative outcomes, yet they are being used by childcare providers to encourage desired behaviors, and especially with children who they perceive as being picky eaters or stubborn or who eat little. Uh, there is also some misconception in understanding what is the difference between encouragement and pressure, what is giving food as reward, and uh, similar studies have reported that food refusal and resistance to trying fruits and vegetables is a common challenge uh, pr uh, with childcare providers. And when children don't eat, it leaves them feeling frustrated and sad. And they have also expressed the need for resources and healthful feeding strategies to encourage children to eat a variety of foods and fruits and vegetables. So then the question remains, how do we feed children? Okay, if we are not using controlling feeding practices, then what do we do? Uh, the Institute of Medicine recommends using responsive feeding. Now, I want you to look at this carefully. What are they recommending in terms of responsive feeding? So the first thing they are saying is that sit at the table and eat meals, with, uh, eat the same foods as the children. They also recommend family-style meal service, and they define it as allow children to serve themselves when serving from common bowls. The uh, third strategy is to allow children to determine how much they eat, and fourth, reinforce their internal cues of hunger and fullness. So my question is, can family-style meal service, which is a term that childcare providers relate to and understand, can family style meal service be used as a potential for implementing responsive feeding in child care settings? So when children serve themselves and we give providers the full story that when they're serving themselves, it's not just for improving their self-help skills, but also when they serve themselves, it will help them determine how much they eat and that will reinforce their internal cues of hunger and fullness. So this is a family style dining and also here providers are sitting with the children during meals and children are serving themselves. So uh, just going back again to some comments by childcare providers, a uh, key to understanding and using or not using responsive feeding was if the providers believed that children could self-regulate their energy intake. So providers who did not practice responsive feeding in childcare said that 
it is a barrier for them to do because they think children cannot self-regulate. So this provider said, well, children cannot select their own portions. I mean their own portion size. We are like, you should probably eat a little bit more than that. You are going to be hungry later, or you shouldn't eat that much to begin with. On the other hand, providers who were practicing family style meals told us that they do it and it's easy for them to do because children can self-regulate their energy intake. For example, this provider said, children will know when they're hungry and they're, when they're not hungry. We don't want to force them to choose their foods, but they get to decide whether they are going to put a scoop or two on their plate. Uh, now, providers who said that they don't use controlling feeding practices and it was easy for them not to use them. So then we asked them, well, then what do you do? How do you get these children to eat fruits and vegetables and you know, try new foods? So this provider said she models healthy eating instead of controlling children's intake. She said, you don't want to force the kid to eat something. We kind of put a different spin on it and we model. If we taste it, telling the child, give it a try, you might like it, the child might try it too. And this provider said that, you know, she used nutrition education, sensory-based nutrition education, where if children are able to touch the food, pick it up, look at it, smell it, they are more apt to taste it. Uh, another provider said that in a childcare setting, it's a group setting, so they see a lot of peer pressure working in a positive way, where if a child tries a fruit, the other children might be able to try it too. So what are we seeing here? So based on what I just discussed with you, I'm developing a curriculum called a integrated or an ecological approach to family style dining for implementing responsive feeding in childcare. Uh, so this includes uh, different lessons. Uh, first one is how to model healthy eating, how to enthusiastically model and overcome some barriers. Like, for example, some provider said, well, I cannot eat that food that's served to children in childcare settings. I don't like it. Then how do I model healthy eating? So, you know, addressing those barriers and really listening to the providers. Peer modeling. Okay, peer modeling works. But how can they make it work in the childcare setting? Allowing children to serve themselves to overcome that barrier of it will be mess, it will be a f it will be food fight everywhere. There'll be food everywhere. Effectively praising children for trying new foods, but not for cleaning their plates. Using nutrition education, so teaching children about you know sensory based nutrition education, and also using books and posters for educating children, for helping them try new foods. Supporting self-regulation. Okay, we can teach them, uh, teach children about internal cues of hunger and fullness, but what does it mean uh, for childcare providers? It's very important for them to understand that th at this early age, children are able to self-regulate their energy intake. And also, uh, they might perceive a child to be picky, but it's important to understand, is this normal or th is this really picky eating? And uh, every lesson includes resources to communicate with parents. So implications for practice and programming. Uh, this curriculum that is being designed is aligned with childcare policies and research related to responsive feeding. And more importantly, it gives verbal communication examples. So what is pressure and what is encouraged? What is the difference between non-internal comments versus internal comments? How can you enthusiastically role model healthy eating? Instead of saying this, say this. And verbal comments is free and does not require much resources except, you know, having those things in the back of your mind. And we are also going to, again, like that provider said, give it a different spin when a child is, you feel like, you know, you have to encourage the child to try fruits or vegetables, use the healthful feeding strategies as an alternative to controlling feeding strategies. Uh, we are also going to address their barriers for the strategy. The format, it includes short videos, mealtime scenarios, assessment questions, lots of examples for verbal communication. The providers can take credits for training 
and uh, it is approved by extension and the Nebraska Department of Education. And the an, another innovative approach, we are finding that a lot of childcare providers are on Pinterest and Facebook. So we are using these, uh, we are using social media, but not much work has been done with social media. So using best practices with social media and also finding that how can we really evaluate impact of using social media. Implications for research, of course, then we want to evaluate the uh, adaptability, feasibility of the program, uh, child eating behaviors, okay, now when we use healthful feeding strategies, how does it impact children's acceptance to trying new foods, eating fruits and vegetables, food choices, dietary intake, their self-regulation in eating, and over uh, the uh, long-term goal is obesity prevention. Now I want to talk about the policies for uh, child care programs. A uh, Head Start program uh, has a requirement that all child care providers who participate in Head Start have to follow uh, family style dining uh, as compared to non-Head Start providers. Therefore, we are seeing that we, uh, most child care providers who are, uh, uh, participate in Head Start serve meals family style significantly more often as compared to non-Head Start providers. They are more likely to sit with the children during meals and also eat meals together with the children. So implications for policy are we are seeing here that Head Start regulations for family style dining are translating into its practice by Head Start providers. Uh, we, are, uh, we also saw that most Head Start providers give suggestions for overcoming barriers to family style meal service and they explain its adv advantages that it leads to pleasant meal times, it's important for children's development, and it helps them eat based on their hunger and fullness. And family style dining, as I discussed, has a potential uh, to, uh, for implementing responsive feeding. So what does all this tell us? I would like to tell you that uh, the proposed Head Start performance standards have removed family style dining as a requirement in their standards. However, there is a potential to comment on the Federal Register. I have worked with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and we have submitted some comments based on this research about the benefits of family meals in childcare to retain family style dining in Head Start performance standards because it also leads to translation uh, of uh, family style dining in childcare settings. And I will encourage you all to please go and comment. This is the link to comment on the Federal Register. And the comment period ends today. So it's very timely. And uh, I am also happy to share with you the comments that we've developed with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to help you uh, write some model comments. The other implication for policy is uh, it is important to operationalize the definition for family style. Now, uh, there is this provider who told us, you know, it's very hard for her to do family style meals at lunch. Uh, she said, you know, uh, there is this accreditation uh, saying that just let children serve themselves. But on the other hand, the food program is saying that you must serve these children this amount. It must all be on their plate. It must be in the cup it all must be served together at the same time. So it's that discrepancy again of what one program says and it's an okay thing and the, uh, as compared to what the other program is saying. So I am uh, very excited to share this with you. I recently received an email from uh, USDA and they are developing this, uh, you know, nutrition and wellness tips for childcare providers and they uh, emailed me because they wanted me they my, uh, wanted my feedback on the family style training that they are developing for childcare providers and they said that they have used the these barriers from childcare providers from our paper and they have addressed some of these barriers in the uh, guidance document and just uh, the barrier that i discussed with you the provider felt there is a discrepancy in the policies they addressed it specifically saying that CSCFP requires that the full portion of each food component of every child be served 
on the table and offered to the children. However, children are not required to take all the components. They also do not have to consume the full portion of any components they take. So I feel this is huge because uh, as researchers, it is very important for us if we really want to be able to implement responsive feeding in childcare, we need to understand what are the providers' perspectives, what are their barriers. And we need to be able to communicate this to the policy makers because ultimately we want that they should be able to comply to the responsive feeding standards. So uh, I'm really taking this approach of working with practitioners, researchers, and also with policy makers to make an impact. So with that, I would really thank you for your time.